Hello everyone and welcome to the Damcasters and part two of our look at the combat bullseye tests in 1967. This week we are getting into the nitty gritty of what happened when they strapped conventional weapons to the bottom of Convair's super speedy B-58 Hustler. But before we get to that, we have a sponsor. A couple of weeks ago, the fantastic team at Exter reached out to me to see if I fancied trying a few of their products. And I have been, including the lovely Parliament Wallet here in Juniper Green Leather, which can hold 12 of your cards, cash, all those good things. You can also pair it with their new tracker card, which is available for Android and iOS and can help you find your wallet wherever it may be lost, which is fab for someone like me who loses their wallet all the time. They also sent over their fantastic grid backpack, which is going to be superb for me as I'm heading off to the States in a few weeks. You get your laptops in it, books up to huge size. So if you use the affiliate link in the description below, along with my code, the Damcasters, you can get up to 55% off in the Black Friday sale that is running right now. So you can try all of their products and you can help support the pod as well. So head to the affiliate link in the description below and you too can be having your very own fancy extra wallet in your pocket. What more can I say? Except back to the show. So this is probably the part of this two-parter that everybody's been waiting for. Could the B-58 have been an effective conventional bomber, much like the B-52 has been? Go check out our episode on the B-52. Chris Gibson returns as we look into the final stages of the combat bullseye tests in 1967. And there's a lot to get into here. We're going to be talking circular error probability and things like that. But of course, this is really the duel between the B-58 and the General Dynamics F-111. The aircraft that really was brought in to replace it, McNamara's dream aircraft that apparently could do everything for everybody. We'll find out a bit about that. And B-1s, because it's my show and I love the B-1. So without further ado, Combat Bullseye Part 2 with Chris Gibson here on The Damcasters. Welcome to The Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bo. So that's phase one and two, transformation, vulnerabilities. And phase three is the formation bombing, which I thought was, given how contested the airspace would be to do a formation bombing, unless I completely misread this, this this bit of your article, that that seemed bold, to be polite. Well, this, 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 the U.S. Army Air Force in the Second World War had worked a similar system using like a, a master bomber, a, a lead bomber in a formation, and as soon as the other bombers saw this aircraft drop its bombs they dropped their bombs. So it had worked in the Second World War. Chances are it would work in uh, Vietnam. I, I think I think you need to say worked in the Second World War. <laughs> 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 that was air quotes if you're listening to the podcast version of this, but that, that's my normal bugbear with. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go back so, to that worked <laughs> in the Second World War. <laughs> Well, mixed formations. The this the the plan was to use the B fifty eight as like a, a lead bomber for uh, formations of uh, fighter bombers, and it, as we found earlier with the tests of formations, formation flying was difficult. They couldn't really do it, especially when there's all these guys shooting at you and just about everybody with a rifle in North Vietnam is going to be shooting you. even if you're up at a thousand feet they're going to be shooting at you mm. and they did have a high density of uh, uh, light anti-aircraft guns and SAMs so it was a, a hostile environment to say the least plus the weather was bad most of the time, You'd, like two monsoons a year and the only safe time for going in would be in the dark. And these fighter bombers couldn't really do anything in the dark. So they needed a, a lead bomber, which is, which was going to be the B-58, using its uh, navigation bombing system to uh, t 
tell them when to drop their weapons. And that was another problem that arose. How does the lead bomber tell the other aircraft when to drop? Because they're going in fast. The timings are really critical. Release times and uh, the aircraft are going to be in trail, staggered. So there's all sorts of time problems. So do you drop the weapons on a verbal command? Do you drop your weapons on a automatic system based on a signal transmitted from the B-58? Or do you drop using a manual system where the B-58 presses a button, uh, emits a tone, and when that tone stops, the other aircraft drop their weapons? So the they tried these things and none of them were really satisfactory. Because you, you've got a quite powerful navigation system within the, the B-58. So getting to the kind of area you need to be, probably not going to be a problem. But as you say there, you then get into slightly imprecise, quite similar to what the Russians were doing in Syria, wasn't it? They were flying to a GPS location and, and, and yeah. dropping... Um, Dropping their weapons, so it's a sim- similar sort of similar sort of process. And, and, and if we go back to the Vietnamese guy saying that the the Americans couldn't hit anything, you're, you're talking like fairly pinpoint targets. You try to hit a SAM site or an ammunition dump, they're, they're, they're not spread over a huge area. And you come mm-hmm. in with a, a formation of aircraft out of like five aircraft, they're going to be spread over quite an area. So the chances are you're going to miss, even under such accurate bombing systems. And remember, it's not the B-58 that's doing the bombing, it's the aircraft behind. So there's that time delay, and uh, it's not actually underneath the point where that aircraft, guiding it, the guiding aircraft is. As your formation diagrams, would, which weren't to scale, but would show, you're spread out over quite a large amount of sky and uh yeah it starts getting a bit a bit well, tricky so only, what they're not only spread Sorry, across on. but uh one of the formations was was a trail so you had four aircraft flying uh in trail behind the b-58 so the b-58 goes hammering over a flat unit and then there's another four aircraft after it so you're going to start shooting you're bound to hit something so that mm. increases your attrition again. So it's, it's just not satisfactory. The best idea is to have the, the aircraft delivering the ordnance to be guided themselves. And that was mm. what the next phase was. So Combat Bullseye 2, we're already starting to see that it was a good idea, but it's not quite working. They've still got another phase to go through of, of things. This one's quite interesting because it starts getting into lots of different elements. And this is the one that seems to sort of fizzle everything out. What what happens in in, in phase, um, sorry, Combat Bullseye 3, CB3, we can call it for... Well, what, for the, the, the one thing that Combat Bullseye 2 did show was that these mix formations were unrealistic. It, in an area where the defences they had in North Vietnam, you just could not fly a formation like that, especially in daylight, because mm. it just take you apart. Combat Bullseye 3 examined using the B-58 as a conventional bomber in its own right and as a pathfinder for the other aircraft so they could mark the target for the next uh, uh, formation coming in. But like I said earlier, it's it's best if the aircraft that's dropping the ordnance has the guidance systems and they can drop them on the target with accuracy rather than around it. Mm -hmm. So they took the B-58 and decided they would put conventional bombs on it. Which is always the great what if, isn't it? That could it have have done something if it had conventional weapons on it? You know, the B-52 could, well, it's a different type of airplane. But this is is where we get into the nitty gritty of whether or not the B-58 could have been a true sort of special weapons and conventional weapons sort of aircraft. 
Well, the classic B-58 photograph shows the big delta with a massive pod underneath. And in that pod is a single nuclear weapon. Later in its career, it was fitted with uh, hard points under the fuselage, which could carry uh, additional nuclear weapons. Because by that time, the weapons were small enough. They could be fitted like that. And it was these uh, hard points called, or designated the MAU-12 hard points. And they were under the rear fuselage, under the sort of forward fuselage of the B-58. And they could carry a single Mark 82 or Mark 84 low drag bomb. Later, they, they attempted and they did test what they call multiple ejection racks, the MER-9, on these hard points, and an MER can carry up to six bombs. Mark 82s again, or uh, they also trialed uh, naval bombs, fire bombs, etc., napalm bombs, and uh, that appeared to be quite successful. But the original big pod had to be retained because it carried most of the fuel for the B-58, so to get the range out of them, they had to carry the pod as well. So that may have restricted the the use of the multiple ejector racks, maybe restricted them to like four bombs rather than six. But the the main problem with what they were doing with the B-58 was that they were they didn't too much fiddling with it. There, there were so many modifications that I think it just got out of hand. They had they had modifications for the conventional bombing. They had modifications for the formation flying at night, poor weather stuff. These jammers, and I, I think they eventually got fed up with all these uh, mods. And anyway, at the time, Strategic Air Command was trying to get rid of their B fifty eights because they were expensive, and their high altitude penetration role was basically wiped out on May Day 1960 when the uh, the U-2 got shot down by a guideline over Sverdlovsk. So that basically put high-altitude aircraft out of business over the Soviet Union. So everything went low level. And really the B-58, spectacular at low level, must have been, but not really its best environment. There's that great footage of them doing the the flight across um, the southwest at low level through the um, the bombing ranges. I think it's I'll try to put it up on here, but it's sort of a camera mounted in the cockpit, and it's just it's it's really cool. But then you remember that it's a a big four engine Delta bomber doing it, and you're like, that's nuts. Well, that's a good in point. a good way, not nuts, nuts. Yeah, bring, bring, let's 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 be let's be fair to the to the aircraft. Well, if they can put a KC-135 through the Mach loop, that's, oh. that's, that's, that's crazy. But I don't know why they did that. Because, you know, you're, you're, you're asking a lot of Convair by this point because the production line's long finished, was it? So I'm just looking. The Pima has the last Hustler, oh. and that's, say, 61 dash so it would have been 63 64 that they yeah. finished the um yeah. Yeah. and j- reader i'm not being i will be defending the b58 and underneath my firefly hoodie i do have my consolidated t-shirt just so i can show you know solidarity with <laughs> the progenitor of, of, of combat uh, but yeah so you're you're right it's it's a lot of fiddling for an aircraft that's already people are already trying to show at the door isn't it yeah i mean its replacement was basically in the offing. It was just about to come into service, and that was the F-111. And during Combat Bullseye 3, they actually did a trial of the B-58 dropping conventional weapons against the F-111 dropping conventional weapons. And this is interesting. Um, If you're aware of the circular error probability of weapons delivery. It's basically it's the radius of a circle within which 50% of your ordnance will fall. The the CEP as it's known for the B-58 
was 725 feet. The F-111 got it down to 200. So accuracy-wise, it was like a no-brainer to adopt the F-111. And the, the F-111 went into Vietnam, didn't perform as advertised, but it was it's still one of my favourite aircraft, I must admit. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I'd struggle to love it. Ah, you've. I ne- probably don't know enough about it. You've never been in the top of a Scottish mountain with an F one eleven going over you upside down. <laughs> That's spectacular. <laughs> no, to be to be fair, when I when I do get up to to Scotland with with my dear wife, mountains don't tend to come up. There's usually a distillery at the bottom of one, as far as I get. <laughs> well, since it was an F-111, you can tell it was back in the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so there's nothing quite as spectacular as that bombing around in, in, in Wales and Scotland these these days. It's, yeah, no, no, that's, no, that's, that's a, whole, whole, a whole other episode. Yeah, yeah cent- central air probability is... Is an interesting thing, and it stand. It's a standard for working out accuracy because it's goes way back. I have reams of stuff on. You, you've done close air support in, in the RAF as, as well, so it's there's whole papers on it. Um, Typhoon and rockets. It comes up a lot. <laughs> oh, that's and, a good uh, yeah. story. Yeah, yeah. We. I think I, I've, I've got. I've got some fun ha- having having been roped in by Nick and Mick to do a, a little article on that. I I went down the CEP rabbit hole hard oh. <laughs> for that rocket thing I did with with Ian Bot, but it's uh, that that's that's not good at all. Seven hundred twenty feet would be quite nice for you know. well, <laughs> for two hundred feet. That's that's, that's nothing. I mean, uh, mm. that's big enough. But you you got to love test test. Test environments for these things, not people. Oh well, the, the funny, the funny thing about the test environment they were using, they were using uh, a range out in the desert, and they had uh, massive range circles from a center point, an aim point, and uh, this is when they were doing the the hustler tests, and they would bring the hustler in, it would deliver its ordnance. And once it cleared the area, the range officers would say, yeah, safe to enter. And uh, these guys would jump in, I suppose it would be a jeep by then, drive to the middle of the the target to this aim point. Uh, did you ever at school use these uh, surveyors wheel things? It's a wheel on a stick mm. for measuring distances. Well, they'd get one of them and they'd, they'd measure from the centre out to the where this practice bomb had landed, and that's how they worked at the CEP. So that's a practical use. High, high tech, high tech here, folks. A practical use for those uh, wheels on sticks, so uh, that you've never seen again since <laughs> school days. So I, I no, actually, no, I better no. not say that because in my last book, I, I went down a weather rabbit hole. And uh, I was dragging up stuff I'd learned at school for nearly fifty years ago. So uh, <laughs> it, it, it's one of those things. There's looking at accuracy and, and things like that, and you start having to break out, you know, ranges, to trigonometry, angles, and things like that. I can re- remember sitting at Q, looking at another ream of dusty old papers that had all of these things in it and remembering me going in my math class, well, I'm never going to bloody use that. Why do I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 40, yeah, 30, 40 years later, I'm sitting here going, I should have really paid attention and I'm having to Google stuff quietly to oh, figure out what the yeah. hell this thing is. Saying. Well, this is actually about the weather over Northern Ireland and how it was affected by air masses. And I thought, I remember this. It's a bizarre <laughs> So anyway, we need, must get back to yeah, we're, 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 ta- we're tangenting. We're yeah. tangenting here. It's, it pre pre Google days, people, we had to figure all this stuff out with a scientific calculator and a pencil and lots of swearing. In my case, I still do. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when I when I was working offshore. 
<laughs> didn't have Google. Was like, oh. Anyway, but yes. back to solving the problems back, back of, Haslers, of, yeah. of the, the, the US Air Force Tactical Air Command over North Vietnam. Uh, so how, how did they... Well, you should you should be asking this. How did they solve this problem? Mm, how, yeah, there you go. Steal my questions. I'll, I'll, I'll have some water. Off, off you go, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> now you asked the question, asked and answered, sir. Off you go. Right. How how, does how did they solve, solve these? How did they solve this problem? Because this is okay. I'm going to jump in. This is where it gets interesting. Because this is where. Another subject which we we do need to cover in depth. So it's coming. This is when we start talking wild weasels and things, isn't it? Yeah, this this is where the combat bullseye story becomes relevant to modern air warfare as we know it now. And one of the main roles of modern air warfare is suppression of enemy air defences. SEAD. that had been that dates back to the Second World War when the RAF were taken out. Uh, radars with rocket firing typhoons, your favourite. Oh, yeah. and... There we go. Everybody can drink now. They've heard. They've heard us talk about typhoons. Ah. So <laughs> the while all this combat bullseye stuff was going on, the US Air Force was developing what they call anti radiation missiles to take on the SAM sites, and uh, they, they started bombing them with cluster bombs using uh, F-100s. That was uh, Wild Weasel 1. Wild Weasel 2, I think, was uh, the F-4 Phantom. But it couldn't carry the big anti-radiation missiles, the standard arm. But the one aircraft that could carry it was the F-105. It became Wild Weasel 3. And Wild Weasel 3 was what they took on the Sams with, uh, with great success. That pretty much didn't negate the Sam threat, but reduced it to allow operations over North Vietnam. But the other problem had been guidance. And eventually they, dis- they, they used uh, long-range navigation systems, Loran, and they became accurate enough that you could drop bombs based on that. It's a bit like uh, the G or uh, the RAF Obo. systems. No, Obo. Obo's the, Obo's the similar, yeah. similar accuracies, but they were getting better and better all the time, and eventually they had uh, EB-66 destroyers, which acted as jamming aircraft, electronic warfare aircraft, and as uh, pathfinders. So they could fly in high altitude with uh, sort of phantoms and F-105s behind them, and uh, they could deliver the, the tone to let the fighter bombers drop their bombs. And another system they used, uh, it was originally developed for delivering the Air delivered seismic sensors. They had to be delivered with great accuracy, so they they fitted a Loran system to the Phantoms that were delivering these, and um, that was then transferred to um, bombing systems. And you can identify these Phantoms because they have a what they call a towel rail aerial on the, on the the back. Uh, so if you see a a phantom with this long rail antenna. That's one of these Loran jobs. And that's how they improved the accuracy. The B-66 is an ugly airplane. <sighs> handsome as handsome does. <laughs> yes, I suppose. I'll, I'll, I'll let it go. So it, it's, it's interesting that a lot of the things that they sort of worked on and tested with a hustler would be workable but with different airframes and oh yeah uh well it's like everyone else i mean the british used the camera for all sorts of things and uh they eventually mm-hmm. found their way into current aircraft and i think it's the same with the b-58 combat bullseye kind of laid the foundations for a lot of these things not just slime lights but uh 
bombing systems and um, the, the use of what was ostensibly a strategic platform for uh, a tactical use. And we see that today, or just the other day, when the B-2s went into Yemen. That's a strategic mm -hmm. platform being used for a tactical purpose. That's what Combat Boo's Eye was about. And, and the B-1? B-1, classic example. I do like a B-1. Yeah. That, that I just said that, so that's an excuse for me to put in a little clip of a B-1 being very noisy right about now. Yeah. <laughs> Put the clip in yeah, where the guy's yeah, getting yeah. blown off the ladders at uh, Cottes Moor. I think it was about 99. <laughs> that, that's my favourite V1 yeah. clip. We, sh we, we shouldn't laugh, but we will. Cause it, it, I did. Know. I was there. <laughs> I was watching it. Were you there? Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, I was there with two of my mates. We were standing off to the, the side off the in the farmer's field, and then the B1 came up, and my mate says, oh, this should be fun. And sure enough, these guys were up the ladders right at the end of the runway, and uh, the B1 went into reheat and threw them away. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah. Terrible shard and I, I remember when Concord diverted into Gatwick, everybody went running down the end of the runway to try to stand behind it when it took off because it did have to do the reheats because yeah. how short that runway is. And uh, they actually had like police trying to <laughs> stop people from standing behind it to get blown across the road, which, which is now closed going under the South Terminal. But wow. yeah, it was. Ah, Good old days, Re reheat. Yeah, you can't be beat a bit of reheat. Aye. Mm. I used to live at the end of Bruntingthorpe Runway in the next village. Mm. And uh, I would go up for the ground runs of the lightnings and stuff. And you forget how loud they are. They're yeah. Really loud. You feel it. I was up there, I think it was last year, we did an episode with... Um, with uh, Dave Thomas and his mm -hmm. his crew, um, when they were when they were firing up uh, their lot, and he yeah he let me play with his hunter, which his <laughs> wife bought him for Christmas. But, yeah, I, I keep we don't celebrate Christmas in our house, but I keep saying to my wife, you ever want to buy me a hunter? <laughs> our, we could probably just get it into the garden. But yeah, it, yeah, there's something nice about one that's just run because you can. It's got the smell. I was once offered a Nimrod AEW3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you need a different size garden for that one, Chris. Yeah, for a tenner. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah Mrs. Yes, the, the, the British taxpayer just puckers. When <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a, <laughs> quite a night that was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let us let let us wrap this up. Otherwise, we can start telling war stories and <laughs> things we get offered for a tenor in a pub. Mine are, are a bit different from this was uh, in yeah, it. From Nimrods, but I... <laughs> that makes it worse. Is it going to land it? You, you you can take it away. I have to get it at the hangar sort of... first. <laughs> <laughs> My dad tells a story of working in Lithuania um, after the, the the collapse of the Soviet Union and. Then they, um, he was working for the British embassy and they were with a British company that wanted to put a petrol station on the junction of highway one and highway two. So they bought one of the corners and it had a bunch of hangers and things on it. And, uh, so they show up and look at it and they're like, Oh, this is great. And they're going to go out for dinner afterwards and they throw open the, the sheds and it's full of APCs. <laughs> and they went, so when are you taking this? And the guy went, 
You bought them, they're yours. Jumped in his car and literally went and cashed the check. <laughs> a, a shed full of BMPs. Nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah brilliant. My dad was like, do you think they'll start? Like, We're not touching them. Locked out. Like, yeah. Same time. That was great fun. <laughs> one of those. But let, let's, let's, let's wrap this up. Let's, this is really the last hurrah of the B-58, isn't it? It's... You know, I, I, we've 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 had um, Sonny Holt on telling us about how the math for the decision was wrong and how capable an aircraft it was, and it was in its in its role. But really, for the USAF trying to figure out a role, because the deployment was going to be quite big. It was going to be Guam and Thailand for was it four wings they were looking at sending out if this had been successful. Yeah, they the, the, the were basically going to like shift the entire force over. To- uh, Southeast mm. Asia, and the, the the thing they were going to fly them out of it was, it was the same same base in Thailand as the B fifty twos were operating from. I've got it written down somewhere. Mm. So it would have been quite spectacular. One thing I I wouldn't have looked forward to would be uh, getting them painted up in the jungle camouflage, which looks great in an F-111, but not, nah, not in a B-58. Camouflage B-58s just don't work. It's a bit like camouflage Mustangs. They don't work either. I don't know. Nah. The, um, the, the ninth Air Commando ones with the five white stripes look quite good. Hmm. Nah, nah. Polished metal. <laughs> <laughs> a Mustang should be polished. Buffed within an inch of its life. <laughs> Yeah. I the, the the one um that was at um Goshawk when I was out in Arizona last year was beautifully in polished and they said you can climb up and have a look at it if you want. I, I felt bad putting fingerprints <laughs> on it because it, 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 there was probably some guy in the hangar going, You are so bastard. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, it's not a DeLorean. It, it, oh goodness, the fingerprints never come off that. To no. be fair, it'd probably come off in your head. Another story. Um so yeah, so this is this is this is it really, isn't it? Because it's the the other thing that came up in your article as well was they didn't actually paint any up. So the the stories and the the modelers who put the black bottoms on them and things ne- never happened. No, partly not. They probably worked up a scheme for it with the paint numbers, etc. Mm. But they never did it. So, and it may have been a bit like. Um, they camouflaged a few vigilantes. The, the U.S. Navy camouflaged their vigilantes, and they found that uh, they made them more visible against the sky. They were fine when, if, if, if there was a fighter looking down on them, they were fine. Camouflage couldn't see them, but if you're on the ground looking up, and a camouflaged aircraft turns, you can you, you see it against the sky, and. Uh, it's one of my bugbears that uh, just about every aircraft, military aircraft nowadays, is a low visibility grey. And this time and again, I've I've seen an aircraft on flight radar. I've gone out the back with the binoculars. I can hear it, and I can't see it because this camouflage works so <laughs> well against the sky. It's, it's really annoying. Mm. But, well, if it's an F thirty five, just look for the the heat haze behind it. And it... <laughs> I've yet to see one. <laughs> I've I've seen them. I've seen what? one on the ground at an air show out in Singapore, but I've never seen one here. So uh, maybe mm. I should go. No, I'm, yeah. Bit no, 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 noisy. Am lots I? of lots of lots of heat. I, I, I'm not, I'm not a fan. So no. I I saw it and went. Mm, it's not here. <laughs> You won't like my heart then. Oh. <laughs> dear, dear listener, if you are listening to the podcast, and Chris has just put on his red Lockheed Martin F-35 hat, and so we're going to start wrapping this up. He's he's lowered the tone too far now. Singapore Air Force. <laughs> so you, we're, we're going to have to have you back, because we were chatting about this just before we started. You have written a list of books which I have either on the shelf or on the wish list that we must have you back to talk about. But what are you working on at the moment that we should be keeping our eyes uh, open for? Because I've, I've just done a, a couple of articles. I've done one for the aviation historian on bombs. 
Uh, it's in conjunction with Ian Bott, who's doing the artwork for it, and it's basically uh, how how we destroyed cities before the atom bomb. So mm-hmm. I'm still working on that. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of worried about the whether it's good taste or not. I'm not sure. Uh, another thing I've been working on on, a, on on this on this channel, Chris. We 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 have we have debated the. the <laughs> The efficacy and efficacy of bombing, and we're actually going to be doing some more with with Doctor Phil Blood in in, right. in in the future as as a present to celebrate his new book War Comes to Arkham, which is fabulous. Dear listener, go buy. I did find online a a, a post uh, post raid <laughs> aerial photograph of Arkham City Center with the cathedral and the Rat House and everything around it destroyed. So. I said, oh, Phil will love that, so it should be arriving in his post box. <laughs> well, if he's ever That's been... the sort of level we get to on this show. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> anyway, the other thing I've been working on is for aeroplane, and that's on uh, General Operational Requirement 339, which led to TSR2. Mm. And uh, so I've been doing that. But meantime, the... the Aeroplane's about to publish, I think it's a December issue, an article I wrote on how to transport tanks. How how to how to carry a chieftain inside a Belfast. And uh, (laughs) well the gist is you don't (laughs) 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 it's just just more of shorts at their uh, devious best so, uh, it's uh, you, you need a runway about the length of the M1 for that I should think uh, not only that you need to get it in, in the first place you've got to strip it well you know how much stuff is on a tank it's just covered in stuff mm. so you've got to take all that off you've got to take all the fuel and the oil out you've got to take all the ammunition out and this thing's supposed to be combat ready when it arrives so you've got to land it Hoist it out. You can't drive it out. You got to hoist it out, hoist it in, hoist it out. Fit, fill it with oil, fill it with fuel, load it up with ammunition, stick the side skirts on. So uh, the first thing you got to land is a recovery vehicle with a full kit and crew. <laughs> so it's just madness. But this is what the army wanted to try. <laughs> they even wanted to airdrop one. <laughs> Airdrop achieved, <laughs> but they, they were saying that. Yeah, the, that sounds like the army. No, the, the RAF were saying oh, the next thing we know, they'll be wanting to airdrop one of these things. <laughs> sure enough, it came in. We want to airdrop one hundred thousand pound loads. And they're like, what? So this is one of these rabbit holes you go down and queue. You find a file and you, 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 you turn on the pages. Oh, yeah, shorts and all that. What? <laughs> 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 a chieftain and uh, ah. that's when I love the marginalia on stuff at Q because there's oh. bound to be some someone who's just scrawled at the bottom going no <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I love quoting the marginalia in my books mm. it makes my day one of the best ones I've seen is uh, it was from uh, a, a couple of generals that visited uh, Westland helicopters to see their new attack helicopter plans. And uh, the the report to his boss says, blah, 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 had a nice lunch. <laughs> and his boss has just put, big tech, VG. <laughs> <laughs> That was it, and they could tell they could tell they'd, they'd been very very well lunched because included with this letter was a, a sketch of this new helicopter. And they must have been hammered when they drew it because it's just complete <laughs> madness. So uh, on the train drawing a helicopter, oh, yeah, yeah, but, uh, great stuff. <laughs> Get, get your crayons out in the room. Just, Chris, uh, this uh, has been a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for, for coming along. We're going to have you back. We'll, we'll, we'll right. chat about that in, in future, but thank you for this. This was, this was interesting because 
the B58 is the single most watched episode I've done so far. Yeah. And the question that always comes up is the conventional question. And now we've been able to, to answer that. And I'm sure there will be lots of comments <laughs> because the B58, if causes controversy wherever it doesn't go. Who's this silly person that doesn't know anything? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you, you've said the magic words that it's expensive and it couldn't drop a conventional bomb. So that you, you've made a lot of a lot of my angry commenters quite happy. So well, it couldn't uh, drop uh, a conventional uh, bomb as good as the F one eleven. Yeah, but then the F one eleven couldn't do it in in reality. There we go. There's there's my anti F one eleven moment. Oh, oh, oh. Tisk tisk. Thank you so much, sir. This oh, has been will. a lot of fun. Anytime. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone that helped me in this because I needed a lot of help from my American friends uh, like Jim uh, Rotromel etc and Jay Miller because my knowledge of American command structures is nil and they put me right on who was who and where they were and stuff like that <laughs> stuff that I never really bother with and normally but uh, so thanks very much to Jay and Jim and my other friends over there that helped. Super. Thank you. Right, thank you. I cannot thank Chris Gibson enough for taking the time to delve into his research about Combat Bullseye First here on the show. If you liked what you heard today, I have to recommend the aviation historian from whom I stole Chris to get this episode done. And Nick and Mick have got some incredible things coming up as the aviation historian goes annual as opposed to quarterly. So we'll be talking to them in the future about that. But check out the link in the description below. And of course, Chris's new book, which is a hefty one, which is they also served RAF reconnaissance and support projects since 1945 is out now. There's links in the description below to that. It is a fantastic book with some really interesting things about what the RAF had planned to support their frontline operations. Of course, if you didn't want to have waited for this episode, you could have got it nice and early as a damn castier over on Patreon. From just three pounds a month plus a bit of that, you get all these episodes early with no ads and you get a welcome pack with stickers and magnets and all that good stuff and a thank you card from me. Check us out on the links in the description below. And of course, thank you for your support. You don't have to be a Patreon for that. Like, subscribe, stick some stars in your podcast app of choice. It all helps. And I am incredibly grateful for everybody who keeps tuning in to watch us talk about some aviation things here on the Damcasters. So until next time, please do take care of yourselves. And as always, thank you so much. Bye-bye. I just want to say many thanks to our fabulous Damcasters on Patreon. If you head over to our Patreon page, you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Boney Abroad podcast production.